uh, John chapter 6. If you, uh, if you have a device, use your device. If you have your own Bible, use your own Bible. Uh, but if not, if you want to use one of these Bibles on the chairs, there's the page number. Do you have spotlights up here? Um, spotlights, spotlights, please. For video sake. Thanks. Love the people online. Not working. Awesome. Okay. Uh, John chapter 6. Uh, we're going to be reading a lot of that chapter tonight. So uh, get there if you can. Uh, we're jumping back into our series, Absolute Authority. Jump back and tell you why we're doing this. Because um, it's been a while. It's been like a month and a half or so since we were preaching through the miracles of Jesus. Here's, it's a twofold reason. Um, there's two people in the world. There's, there's, there's either the person who's decided to make Jesus Christ the Lord of their life. And, whoo, and, uh, <laughs> heal me, Lord. <laughs> they, they decided to make Jesus the Lord of their life. Uh, but sometimes it's a little bit of a lull in their faith, uh, kind of like the one I'm in, as you say or look at me. And sometimes we need a little bit of a boost. And so what we want to do is we want to look at the miracles of Jesus Christ. When he does these crazy, crazy, amazing things, um, we can look at those and go, you know what? If he can, like, uh, raise a dead dude, then he can probably take care of my problem. Like, my little bad attitude that I have in front of you, like, I'm going to probably let that out a lot. So I just be ready. Uh, you can pray for me if you want. That'd be awesome. Um, but then there's the other person. There's the one who's, who believes and is in a lull and needs a boost. And then there's the other person that has not made a decision at all who their Lord and Savior is. And so what we want to do as we examine the, the miracles of Jesus Christ is we want to give you quality information so that you can make a choice. And if it's for Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and God, awesome. That's what we all want for you here. But that may not be your choice. I don't know what your choice is going to be. But there's a lot of options out there that you can choose. But there's only one. There's only one that's real and true and God, and that's Jesus Christ. We want to give you some evidence of his deity. So that's what we're going to do. Now, this, the whole process here uh, is to allow Jesus to build his church. Uh, Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So he wants to build his church, and whether it's to deepen the relationship of someone who's already in the, in the bride, or if it's to start a relationship with someone who's not in, yet in the bride, he wants to build his church. We can melt down how he builds his church really in, in very simple terms. He just builds confidence in people. You, you see what I'm saying? He builds confidence in people. If you already are a believer, he builds that confidence in you so that you can deepen your relationship and trust him more and believe in him more. You know what I'm saying? Or he might just initiate some, some uh, initial confidence in someone. Like they had no confidence in anything, and now all of a sudden they're going to start having some confidence in Jesus Christ. So he is building confidence in people. And so we get that from like the Great Commission where he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, therefore go. So he's like, I am the boss. I'm Lord. I'm creator. I made everything. I hold all things together. Now, all of creation is subject to my authority. I'm the boss of all things. And because I really am the boss of all things, therefore you can go. You're justified in making disciples of me. Because I am God. I am the right way to do it. So you can uh, forget all the other stuff. You're going to teach everyone. Teach everyone about me. I am the right way. Okay? So that's why we've been studying the, the, through the Gospels. And we're, we're checking out all of his miracles. So we can be boosted in our confidence in him. Okay? Now tonight is no exception. We're going to study uh, a miracle. It's the feeding of the multitudes. He feeds thousands of people. Okay? Uh, it's amazing. This this miracle that's found in John chapter 6 is the only miracle, and I, I believe it's the only miracle, that is found in all four Gospels. Okay? So, I, like, I don't want to dwell on that a lot, other than I'm just going to say this, that if it's in all four Gospels, if God inspired all four guys to cover this story, why? Why, why would you think it's important it's really, really important. And you're going to see that as we unpack this miracle. It is extremely important, okay? Uh, let's go here. Let's go to John chapter 6. And I'm going to start reading. Uh, I'm going to read the first 15 verses, okay? So a little bit more reading than normal. And uh, then we'll jump into it. Let him build. You know, I want to pray with you. Let him build your confidence tonight. I need confidence boost myself. So. I'm going to pray for you guys, and then you guys can pray for me, and we'll just be one big, happy, snuggly family. Is that cool? Yeah, let's do that. Father God, we, uh, we thank you for letting us gather here tonight. Thank you for giving us a purpose for gathering. 
It's a nice little social club. We're not here for some turkey dinner. We're here to feast on your word. We're here to, 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 to feast on truth. We, we want to know you. We want to get to know you well. We want to have an intimate relationship with you. We want to experience you here tonight. I shared with the band earlier that it was my desire, Lord, to get out of the things of this world and the fleshy day I've had. Not a bad day by any means, but uh, a day that just didn't seem to have any depth, no meaning. Uh, that somehow tonight here, you would show up in some way where we would uh, literally experience you in some, in some tangible way. I'm sure I speak for all of us here. That's what we all want. We want to experience God. We want to experience Moses up here talking. We don't want to experience Harry and gals up here singing. It's not that. We want to experience you. We want to experience you. So, Lord, I pray that as we uh, proclaim your word here, that you would speak to each and every heart that's here. That they would know that it's you that's knocking on their door. And that you, you bless, uh, just soften our hearts so we would we'd open the door and let you and do some change in us. That's what we want. We want to change. We want to be different. We want to be more like you, Jesus, when we leave here tonight. That's our desire. So do it now. Use my foolish preaching for that, please. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You ready to read? Alright, here we go. Um, John chapter 6. The reason I'm going to John instead of Matthew is that it's in all four, but I think this is the, just the, this, for, the, for, our, for our lesson tonight, this is the best one. It's the best one, okay? But you can read all if you want. Okay, after this, doesn't matter what it was, something else happened. You could read it. After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because he saw his mirac they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Uh, Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? Here's a claim uh, of deity here. Just don't, don't miss this. He was testing Philip. So he already knew what he was going to, going to do. Uh, Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There is a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. Well, what good is that with this huge crowd? So Jesus responds. Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus. Said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered seven thousand. I'm sorry, five thousand. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Some of the other gospels will tell you that he gave the, the he broke off the fish and broke off the bread. He gave it to his disciples, and then they handed it out. Now afterward, he did the same with the fish. And they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples. Now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, Surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. This, uh, this story, and, and I'm sure many of you have read it many, many times, this, this story is just, just uh, for lack of a better term, it's just ate up the teaching. There's, there's, all, there's all kind of ways you could go. You know what I'm saying? There's all kind of stuff you could talk about. Um, for instance, you, you could talk about how God, in, in his word, he says, you know, God, all things are possible. You know, he, think about it. He had, he had five little loaves of bread and, and two little fish. Now, I was going to go to the store today and buy that and show it to you, but I don't want to stick the joint out, so you guys can thank me later. Okay, with fish. But that, that's what he had, you know, with, with God all things are possible. So you think about this, this amazing miracle, and if you guys were reading this, if you could kind of visualize just this gentle rolling hill, the grass blowing, and maybe a rock here and there, and a tree here and there, and there's just thousands and thousands of people sitting there, and you just see this basically this one plate of food, which, you know, would be enough food maybe for like one or two guys, you know what I'm saying? And he multiplies this. So we can kind of talk about how insanely miraculous it was that he multiplied all this food. Um, we could talk about the fact that, you know, bringing spiritual nourishment and physical nourishment to people is our job. That, that Jesus blesses people 
through us, if you will. Uh, remember, he says, Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, feed my sheep. So he's telling his disciples, you know, it's your job. If you love me, then you'll go and take care of my people. So we could talk about that, being a, a proper disciple, and what our duty is joyfully as a disciple of Christ. We could uh, look at the part where he talks about collecting left, leftovers, and, and so nothing is wasted. So we could talk about stewardship, you know, where a lot of uh, churches and pastors will talk about that a lot, you know, how we're supposed to steward something, handle it responsibly, save and, and, and tithe and all, all those types of things. And anything that you've been given to, to manage, you should be responsible with. We could talk about stewardship for sure. We, we could talk about this, we could talk about the fact that Jesus can multiply the little thing that you a lot of us feel like we don't have a whole lot to offer God. There's little people. And, and we can talk about how if we bring him our, our couple of loaves and our couple of fish, like if he could do great things with the little that you'll offer him. You know, and I want to I take a little of the intimidation away. You know, churches are always hammering about tithing. You know, tithing is 10%. You guys know that, right? Tithing is 10. I don't know about you, but it's been a long time, a big period of my life where 10% of my income would have been devastating. I mean, let's face it, like, living on 100% of my income wasn't going to do it. So giving up 10% of it, you better tell that preacher to step off. You know what I'm saying? That's my money, and I can barely live on it. So let me just tell you this. If you can't give 10%, it's cool. Start with 2%. Start with 1%. Just do anything. Just bring bring Jesus a couple of fish. You know what I'm saying? Just see what he will do with it. And then ask him as you bring your 2%. You might think that, I don't know your perspective, maybe 2% is massive. But maybe, you're, maybe you feel pathetic even bringing it. But you know, whatever your perspective is, bring it and say, you know what, Jesus, here's my 2%. But like, I don't even feel like I can live without this. Would you prove me wrong? Or, or maybe you're saying, you know, uh, Jesus, I'm not giving you 2%. I know I'm pathetic. But would you please help me with my faith? So maybe I don't feel so pathetic. But bless my 2%. And help me to give free. Maybe, maybe you know a percent a year. Whatever. I don't know. Just bring, bring him something. Maybe he does something great with it. Here's our lesson here tonight. It's none of those things. Our lesson, it almost works against the miracle. Okay, hear me out. There's a verse of scripture, I'm going to read it to you. You don't need to go there, I'll just read it to you. Uh, it's found in Romans chapter 1. Uh, Paul's writing to, the, to this church, and um, this is what he says. He says, they traded, these people traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself. Sometimes we live out that verse in a flagrant way. Like we worship an idol carved of wood. Do you know what I'm saying? Like an, an idol. An idol. Maybe it's made out of rock. <laughs> Maybe it's your wife. Maybe it's your husband. Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's something you can like see it, taste it, touch it, hear it, feel it. Like something tangible. That's a flagrant violation. A flavored file, you know? When someone goes up for, for the layup and they just hack them right in the face on purpose to knock them down. They get a flavored foul. That's a flavored file. An idol you can see, touch. You carved it out of wood, you carved it out of marble. But sometimes trading the truth about God for a lie and worshiping and serving the things that he created instead of him himself, sometimes it's really, really subtle. And you don't even notice it. Point out something that a lot of people do. And you might not know this. Maybe you will after we get done. I believe in the life that I live that Jesus and his church here in this country, in this county, in this city, have been reduced. Reductionism takes a phenomenon, something that's wow and awesome and big and unexplainable and they just reduce it down and they explain it to nuts and bolts like you can explain try to explain creation 
And we get into fights about creation and evolution because we think like we can somehow explain the unexplainable. Like even us that love the Lord and know that He created, right? You guys all know that He created everything? Are you with me? Go explain it. How can you debate something like that? Like I got no proof. I wasn't there. I don't know how it worked. He opened his mouth and boom, stars come out. Like, who got that? I don't. Okay, I don't have that. But Jesus and his church, his body, us, the representatives of Christ here on this earth, we've been reduced. Let me, let me try to explain what I'm talking about. Oftentimes, Jesus and his body are melted down into two things. These are very common things. Um, let's talk about felt needs. You know, you, Jesus, he scanned the landscape of where he was, and he saw people in need, and he served them, and he healed them, and he provided for them. You know what I'm saying? Like, he did stuff for them when they were in need. He saw them, and they were like a sheep without a shepherd, and he wept, and he, and he, and he solved their problems, right? He did that. And so Jesus did that, and so, of course, the church, that should be what the church is about. The church, I've read books about this, about they don't really even care about the guy getting up here talking to you about Jesus, teaching, discipling, that, that doesn't matter. Are you helping people? Like, that is what the church is supposed to be. That's what Jesus did, and so that's what his church should be, seeking out those that we can help in his name, but, but helping them. That's the felt need thing, okay? And see, this is what happened. People get so disgruntled about the church, they start parachurch organizations that are pinpoint accurate. Like, they have one thing that they do. That is their job. Like, uh, Mary, she's got the, she works for Deliver the Difference. Like, that's a, these people that are running are Christians, they love Jesus. That's their thing. They see hungry kids, they, they collect food, and they feed them. That's what they do. But that's not the fullness of Jesus Christ. It's by far not the fullness of the church of Jesus Christ. But some people perceive it as such. They reduce Jesus down. They reduce down his church to be that group. And that's not what it is. The other thing that churches do, and, and Jesus has been melted down to this, and churches have been melted down to this, is this whole idea of the, the supernatural and the signs and wonders. These are great things. You read the scriptures, you see all these amazing things that God did opening the Red Sea, raising people to new life. Just crazy healing of lepers, healing of blind people, doing this, feeding the multitudes with a couple of fish and some bread. All these amazing things, but people think that, that, that the church is the place where that stuff happens. Like, that's what you do when you gather together. You just perform all this stuff because that's what Jesus did. Jesus did all these things, and so that is exactly what the church should be doing. And the only problem with that is that's just a couple of the facets of this beautiful diamond called Jesus Christ. People have a very low view of Jesus. They have a very low view of the church, okay? Which is, you know, Jesus, I've said this before, say it again. <coughs> Jesus was the visible image of the invisible God. You can't see God, so he comes down in the body, right? Now Jesus goes to heaven, we're the visible image of the invisible Jesus. We're his body, we're his representatives, we're supposed to be just like him right here, right? But people have a low view of Jesus, therefore they have a very low view of us as a church body. Okay? Let, me, let me share with you what I'm talking about. Just here in the text that we just read, in verse 14, they refer to Jesus as the prophet. Now, listen, there's nothing wrong with the prophet. Prophets were great men. Like, these were incredible guys that, like, heard from God and spoke for God. Like, thus saith the Lord, right? These are guys with authority. A lot of times they would predict future events with pinpoint accuracy. They were on it, right? These were incredible people, but what were they? They were men. They're just men. New Testament, you see prophetess, just women. They're just people, right? They're not God, they're just people. Verse 14, uh, verse 15 says they're going to force him to be king. Now kings are mighty and awesome men, right? They, 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 they command respect, they have great authority, a lot of riches and power and palaces and all kinds of stuff. They're very powerful, influential men that, 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 that ruled over large chunks of land, you know, millions of miles, just all kinds of like Roman Empire stuff, right? These are incredible, uh, powerful men, but what were they? Men. If you look over at verse 25, verse 25, they call him teacher. In Hebrew, they, they would call him rabbi, rabboni, right? They would call him, but he said, not teachers. 
And we have some teachers in our church. Like my wife, she did 20 years as a teacher. You know, and teachers are very well respected. They're underpaid. But they're respected. Why? They're smart. They're considerate. They're compassionate. They do it because they love children. They love people. They don't do it for the money. They're just great people. Who doesn't love a teacher, right? You love a teacher. They're just good people. We have high respect for them, but they're just a person. Paul tells us in the book of Colossians that in Christ lives all the fullness of God. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a king, and he's not just a teacher. He's God, okay? That's, that's a big, there's a big difference between prophet, king, and teacher, and God. You see what I'm saying? It's a massive difference. But our tendency as humans is to reduce things down and try to explain them. They, they get simple, and so the phenomena is lost. And so when we read this amazing miracle of the feeding of the multitudes, it's easy to slip into thinking that this kind of magical transformation from a happy meal to a full catered dinner for seven to 10,000 people. See, it said it was 5,000 men, right? Maybe some of these men had wives. Maybe some of these men had a girlfriend. Maybe some of these men had kids, right? So let's just, I don't know the exact number, but this 5,000 men is probably seven to what, 10,000 people on that ground. Listening to and watching all this happen. So he takes this little happy meal, if you will, and he transforms it into this catered dinner for all these people. So it's very, very easy to think that that simple transformation from the happy meal to the dinner is the, the epitome of awesomeness, but it's not. By any stretch of the imagination, it's not. Jesus he teaches and he heals. Jesus provides. Jesus raises people from the dead. Jesus walks on water. He calms the storms. He casts out demons. But these miracles were never, ever intended to terminate on themselves. Which might, many, many people think that they are. They were never intended to terminate on themselves. They were always intended to point to something greater. Every single one of them. Meeting felt needs and supernatural signs and wonders, somehow they're perceived as the end. When all the while Jesus and all that he did, that he always intended them all to be a, a, a means to an end. They were never the grand prize by any means. Now, um, I'm going to be a little short tonight, but I wanted you to do this. Uh, go with me uh, back to the, to the text, okay? To properly understand this miracle right here and to, to appreciate it in its fullness. Okay, you have to read on. And you'll understand what I've been talking about here for the next the last few minutes as we read on in this text. See, if you just read the miracle, you lose the reason for it. Okay? And, and we're fortunate, and I think that's why it's in all four gospels. He you've got to get this point. The Bible So, so, so let's just jump down here. Let's just keep reading, okay? 
Look at verse 26, let's read it. I tell you the truth, you want to be with me because I fed you. Not because you understand the miraculous signs, but don't be concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. They replied, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? And Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. He's saying, this is what I want you to do. I don't care if you walk on water. I don't care if you multiply food. I don't care if you heal the blind. I want you to believe in me. That is what, that's the mission of every miracle. Is that you believe in him. That you build confidence in you about him. That's it. And he says, um, that's what I want you to do. Believe in the one he sent me. Who sent? Who he sent. They answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. That's the to me, in all of Bible, that's the epitome of arrogance. That makes me mad to even read it, and it was a long time ago. <laughs> show, us a, <laughs> show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? All, after all, our ancestors ate manna while they were journeying through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven, my father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they said, give us that bread every day. And then Jesus replies, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So he cuts to the chase. What's Jesus doing? Can you see the ladder almost, right? He's trying to shift their priorities. We are so carnal. We are so simple-minded. We're like shallow, a little shallow, but we don't even realize that there's a better thing out there. We're at the bottom shelf of the discount toys, all, all the good stuff's up here. We don't, even know how, we don't even know that that shelf exists. And he's trying to call us up there and shift our priorities. 26 and 27, he's talking, he says, don't even, cons why are you even concerning yourself with things like, that are, that are meaningless, like food? You know, and that's just, that to me is shocking because here in America, like, what's the list of necessities? Right? We, we say that our necessities are food, water, clothing, shelter, right? We need, like, those are the basic needs. And Jesus, he's blowing this stuff out of the water. Here's the revolution again, right? He's like, the, the, this thing, like, that you, that you think is important, food, why are you even thinking about that? Why do you even care? And he'll say, you know what? This dominates the mind of the unbeliever. If you're, a, if you're a disciple of Jesus, you shouldn't be thinking about stuff. Look at the animals out there. Look at the flowers in the field. Don't I take care of them? The birds don't store up food in arms. They're not safe enough. They're not worried about what am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? Oh, he's like, I take care of them. And you're my perfect creation, made in my image to be like me, my greatest creation, my masterpiece. And you're worried about food? Like you're not going to take care of it? What's wrong with you people? Step up, step up, step up. Take your eyes and get them off the little perishable things that mean nothing. Get them up here on me. It's not the provision that's, that, that matters here. That's not the important thing, okay? Life is not the pursuit of things that God can give you. It's the pursuit of God himself, okay? Jesus is the pearl of great value. You see, a lot of us are trying to chase after what Jesus can do for us or give to us. And those are, those are byproducts of that. But the one thing that we should be earnestly seeking after is Jesus Christ himself. It's all to be found in Christ. That is all that matters. That's what we should be pursuing. To, to seek me with your whole heart and you'll find me. Seek first the kingdom of God and my righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Not, don't search after these things. Search after me and I'll give you those things. And so we need to be pursuing Jesus in an intimate relationship with him. And that's all that matters. Let me try to explain this the best I can. With a feeble mind, I'll do my best to explain what I'm talking about. Like, Meredith and I, we have this motorcycle race. We like to ride. I did this story just so I could breathe. <laughs> we like to ride, right? Uh, we bought this motorcycle because we don't have a lot of money. And so we don't want to, it seems like every time you go out, you just spend money, right? So you're always spending money. So we dropped 2,500 bucks on tax time three years ago. We buy a motorcycle, it's bought and paid for. Now, 
that's the day. You know what I'm saying? That's the day. You just ride. And, and, and along the way, there's beautiful sights. We try to go off 441 and get to some country roads through Howie, Yalaha, and all these different places. They're real pretty. Back roads through Umatilla, things of that nature. So there's a lot of beautiful sights, but that's not what it's all about. Sometimes we have a destination in mind where we go get a cup of coffee somewhere and sit out and sit in a park or sit Dunkin' Donuts, drink a coffee and just talk and enjoy that, you know, that, and that's good, but that's not really what it's all about. The destination really doesn't matter. Sometimes, more than half the time, we don't even have a destination. We just fly. We go nowhere. We make a big circle and come back. It, 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 the sights are beautiful. Oftentimes, the destination is awesome, but it's the ride itself. You see what I'm saying? It's, a, it's the fact that I'm just on the motorcycle, just enjoying that. That's the beauty of it. And, and see, sometimes we focus in our, in our walk with Christ, we're focusing on the sights, the things that He can bring to us. You know what I'm saying? Or, or, the, or, or what He can do for us, or, what he, or how He can help us, instead of Jesus Himself. See, Jesus is the motorcycle ride. And just to enjoy a relationship with him. He's the grand prize, but oftentimes people miss the grand prize because they're, they're, they're messing around with the consolation prizes. The little prizes they think, oh, I got this. And, and Jesus is like, why are you even worrying about these perishable things? Just throw that. That's crap compared to, to what I want to give you, which is what? Me. Have me. Enjoy me. It's what they settle for, for, the, for the short end of the, of the pool. But what happens here in our text, you see that he's kind of stepping up the ladder. They get past the whole idea of the food, right? You, you came to me because I fed you. Not because you understood the miraculous signs. So they, they're like, okay, 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 I got this. Okay, it's not about the food. It's not about, I don't want to be shallow-minded. I'm not thinking like this anymore. Right? Okay, it's better than that. It's about the miracles. So what miracles can we do? That's not what it's about either. It's not about the miracles either. They stumble upon the miracles. Remember I told you that sometimes it's flagrant and sometimes it's subtle. How we trade the truth about God for a lie and start worshiping something that was created rather than the creator himself. Okay, sometimes it's subtle, but this one right here, I mentioned to you a moment ago, this is flagrant foul. They, they say, well, prove it to me. Like somehow God needs to prove himself. He needs to prove himself to these people. What can you do? Moses gave us bread. Moses gave us bread. You know, we can, we can read in the Bible where there was bread. It was coming out of heaven. It was on the ground for them. And they were hungry. There was food that appeared. That's pretty awesome, right? I'd love to see that. I mean, let's just be honest, right? I'd love to see that. And that wasn't enough, so they complained a little bit more. And so then he brought quail for all you rednecks. Hey, boom. Right? I heard a click in the back. <laughs> Right? That was good. Then they needed some to drink, so out of a rock comes water. Like, you can do all these things, right? We've we heard about it. It's incredible, right? And so these guys are like, well, what can you do? Prove it to me. Well, Matthew 16, 4, Jesus says, only an evil and adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. People walk into churches all the time, and they want to know, you guys exercising all these gifts? Is the supernatural happening? I want to see it. Because if I'm going to consider this a real church, I can see that stuff. What did Jesus said. Only those who are evil and adulterous would demand to see a miraculous sign. Listen, um, signs and wonders, let me tell you, let me tell you two reasons why Jesus would, like he can say it because he wants to say it, but let me give you two reasons why he's justified saying it that, all, that you don't need to ask for. Them, okay? Supernatural signs and wonders, they ain't got no super glue in them. Let me explain why, okay? Man from heaven, Exodus 11, quail, don't know what chapter, water from a rock, don't know what chapter, but I do know what, you go to Exodus 32, just a couple chapters later, and they're worshiping a golden calf. Did they see some stuff? Yeah, they saw some of it. Who's ever seen water coming out of the rock? Who's ever seen the... The, the thousands of quail just fall so we could eat them. Who's, who's had men in their front yard when they got up in the morning? Anyone here? Like these people saw that stuff and a couple chapters later they're worshiping a golden calf. There's no super glue in the miraculous signs and wonders. 
And here's the second one. This is not biblical. This is mosical. Okay? You don't ask. You don't demand God to show you nothing. He owes you nothing. He owes me nothing. Okay? This guy was a perfect human being. God made him come down with a perfect life. Goes to the cross absorbing the, the just and just tremendous wrath of God for your sin. Goes to the cross and dies because of it. Gets buried in the tomb and rises from the grave. He doesn't need to do anything else. But does he need to like maybe do a card trick for you? Maybe, maybe he just needs to pull a, a rabbit out of a hat so people will believe, right? Like, like rising from the dead out of your own strength isn't enough. <laughs> do something to prove it, Jesus. <laughs> the, the, listen, the goal in all that Jesus did, does, and will do, and everything that the church should do is all about this. Verse 29, verse 32. Read it, let's read it again. This is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. Now, I want to I go sideways here for a minute. Remember, I said this to build confidence. Everything that he does is to build confidence. And this word believe, I don't know if you agree with me, I don't know if you're the same as I am, but when I think of the word believe, I, I think of, okay, I did believe in that too. That's where I am. That's what I think. But I want to reiterate this, that it could be that you just need to believe more. In the scriptures, there's a guy who says, I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. And so when Jesus says, believe in the one he has sent, he's not just saying to those that are not Christians, now become Christians. He is saying that. But he's also saying to the Christian, believe in me more. Like you believed in me, but now I did this in front of your face, and you should be like, wow, I want you to trust and, and believe and depend on me even more than you did before I did it. Okay? He wants you to believe. Deepen the relationship with those who are already Christians. Begin a relationship with those that are not yet Christians. Look over here in verse uh, 32 through 35. I tell you the truth, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did, and now he offers you the true bread from heaven, the true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven, Jesus, and gives life to the world. I am the bread of life. Everything that Jesus did and everything that the church does should be to point people to a closer relationship with Jesus. Okay? So the mission of the, of the Revolution Church and the mission of Jesus Christ and we're a new church, okay? The church has been going for thousands of years, but the mission of Jesus and the mission of church and now the mission of this revolution church should be one in the same, okay? Pointing people to the Savior in a greater way in every single thing that we do. Whether it's to start a new relationship with Him or to deepen an existing relationship with Him, everything we do should be to move people into believing in the Son of God so they will have eternal life. Now, feeding people, healing people, um, and whatever it is that we do, building, rebuilding homes after a tornado, going to Haiti, going to Mississippi, Alabama, Kansas for tornadoes, floods, uh, bringing medicine to, to, to nations that need it, uh, adopting kids uh, that, that are starving and in sex trade, uh, singing, uh, preaching, translating Bibles into languages so everybody in the world can read it and, and have faith and hope and, and believe in Jesus. Whatever it is that we do, right, every single thing that we do, they're just nice things if they're not intended to move people closer to Christ. So whatever your shtick is, that's awesome, but it should be to move people closer to Christ, period. And that's it. And that's it. Seek and save. Remember what I've been talking about last week? That's everything. That's the revolution. What did he do? He came to seek and save. He didn't come to perform miracles. He used his miracles to seek and save. Are we connecting? That's why he did it. Everything he did, and therefore everything we do, seek and save, seek and save, seek and save. Jesus Christ 
is the grand prize. Jesus Christ is the motorcycle ride. And so everything we do, everything, whether we're gathering here, we have about 17 opportunities to gather in this church on a weekly, monthly basis. So whether it's Bible studies, to deepen our relationship with Jesus, if it's something supernatural that happens that we can't explain, and I'd love to be a part of those, that type of church. I love when things happen we can't explain, because then it's not some dude getting up with a good business plan. It's just something you go, I don't even know how it happened. God must have shown up. That's kind of cool. I want that, right? So whether it's a Bible study, whether it's a dinner, whether you're discipling somebody, whether you're laying hands on someone and bless them and they get healed, Whatever it is, if you go on a mission trip halfway across the world because you want to go bring the gospel or you want to go help somebody, whether you're, Tim pressing the button on the recorder to just record the video, not just to record the video, but to bring this Bible that I'm saying, bring it and bring it to people across the world. Why? So they can have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the only reason why we would do any single thing that we do. Supernatural, felt needs, anything. Everything Jesus did was to bring people closer to Him. And so I just want to, I just want to reiterate that. I want to reiterate that that He builds His church by building confidence in people, not in yourself, but in Him. So when, he, when you see something in Scripture that He does, we celebrate it. We celebrate it, but we don't celebrate it. We celebrate the result of it. Everything that he did was to bring people to himself in a deeper way. And so I just want to encourage us here, as we move on, move forward over time, and new things begin here, and, and something swells up in your heart, and you say, you know what, I think we should do this. Listen, the motivation behind it must be this, before we even entertain it. It must be to bring people closer to Christ. And that's it. If that's not the reason for it, we're not doing it. Okay, that's it. I want to pray with you now. This is your treat for uh, this year. It'll be very short. I want to pray with you, and then Kelly's going to lead you, and we're going to take communion. So whoever's going to give communion, please, if you could distribute that, I'd appreciate that very, very much. And I want to pray with you. Father, I thank you for letting us gather here tonight. Thank you for, for being mighty. Uh, my, own, <clears throat> my own battle tonight, you, uh, you know, you held me up and kept me going. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for every person that is here. I pray, Lord, that um, that the lesson here tonight would not fall on deaf ears, but it would actually permeate our hearts and change us. Lord, I thank you for all the miraculous things that you've done, things that we cannot explain. Several of us in this church, if not all of us, have experienced some things that are <clears throat> kind of unexplainable, uh, but those are great things. And, and we just want to take a moment before we take communion, maybe just to reflect back on on that time when you invaded our space and did something that we would call supernatural. We can't explain it. We're not going to reduce you down here, Lord. Uh, we're not a reductionist church. We are a church that glorifies and magnifies you. We want, we want to magnify who you are and what you've done. You're an amazing God. And so, Lord, help, help us take a moment um, before we take communion to perhaps think of that time when you did the supernatural in our own life. Or well, perhaps we Think back to some of the miracles we studied in our scripture. And we see you do incredible things. And we needed to, to have some enlightenment there. Maybe we just didn't understand. You know, why'd you do this? Why'd you do this? And really it's, it's because you want to move people closer to you. To believe in you. It's always reflect on that. Thank you for the opportunity to get up here and do what I'm doing. Even though I'm a grumpy man sometimes. You have grace. Show me great place, and I appreciate it very, very much. Mm -hmm.